Crimes of the Future, the new film from David Cronenberg. The release schedule seems erratic. We don't know whether we'll see a UK release. I'll admit I haven't researched this in depth. My own interest has been getting to see it as soon as I possibly could. And instead of doing it in a legal stream, which I don't really believe in, I believe in artists making money for their work, I decided to acquire a Canadian Blu-ray as that appears to be the first Blu-ray release in the world and I received that this week and watched it one evening. I couldn't wait till the weekend because I was too excited. So what we're going to do in this video is have a look um, at the history of Crimes of the Future, not just the new film but the original Crimes of the Future which came out in 1970 and was Cronenberg's second sort of fuller length feature film. I'm going to discuss Crimes of the Future in, the, in its true context, which is that of new wave science fiction. Cronenberg has been, to my way of thinking, the world's most important science fiction filmmaker pretty much since the end of the 1970s. Nearly all his films before a certain date are science fiction films. The only notable exceptions before he broke away from genre filmmaking in the 90s, I would say, are really examples of SF. The odd ones which are not are Fast Company, the film he made about the world of drag racing, which is his least seen film, which I've had for many, many years. And I recently, I say recently, about two years ago, acquired a Blu-ray edition. And it's quite unlike his other work, but it is good fun. It's a little exploitation movie. Then, of course, all his major feature films were SF until we got to Dead Ringers, which kind of has speculative elements. It's more of a slipstream movie. I would say that it bears the same sort of relationship to the rest of his earlier oeuvre. The sort of Ballard's work does when he starts to sort of step away into the urban trilogy and things like Empire of the Sun and what have you. But it kind of has the feel of SF and we'll return to that. Then, of course, there was the abortive project of M. Butterfly, his biggest budget to date, um, which had a terribly minor release in the um, UK and is one of the few Cronenberg films I didn't get to see in the cinema on first release. Then we have things like Naked Lunch and Crash. And, of course, in this century, we've seen him making more mainstream dramas. So, of course, they've had the Cronenberg edge, things like Cosmopolis, Maps of the Stars, what have you. Also, of course, after a certain date, all his films were adaptations of other people's work, and they were primarily from literary sources, of course. And the last sort of pure Cronenberg for many, many years was Videodrome from 1983. And then we sort of fast forward to um, Existence in the late 90s, which was the first full-blown original Cronenberg script without any input from other sources um, since Videodrome. And then we've gone a very, very long time since then up to Crimes of the Future, which was originally meant to be filmed around about 2003 under the title Painkillers. Now, of course, Painkillers is also the title of a novel by Simon Engs, a very, very good science fiction novel, which I recommend you get. I have recovered it in one of the other videos. Maybe I'll cover it again when I do some other roundup of recent SF. What can you expect from from Crimes of the Future, the new version. Now, it's worth saying there's been a lot of confusion about this, that the new one is not a remake of the original one. Well, it's not. And if you look on Wikipedia, it says they're unrelated. Well, they are and they're not. They're related in the sense that they're both SF and they're both Cronenberg. And they both look at sort of disastrous changes in the environment, as it were, caused by mankind's machinations with science, as we'll see. So just to talk about the new film briefly, stars are Viggo Mortensen, Leia Sadu, and Kristen Stewart, who gives a fantastic performance as Tim Lynn. Um, that really was the standout thing for me. And I'm just going to talk about it. I'm going to talk about the plot a little. I'm not going to talk about it too much because you want to see it for yourself. The film was actually shot in Greece for monetary reasons because Cronenberg has for many, many, many years struggled to get this funding for the sort of films he wants to make. And at one point he actually said that he'd retired. So he managed to sort of get this shot over in Greece. And obviously it's going to be a complete shot in the arm for the Greek film industry because there's lots of Greek people involved. You see the credits, it's really quite something. The milieu that's depicted is quite sort of run down and there's a lot of graffiti everywhere. There's sorts of buildings falling apart. And obviously this is sort of advantage of shooting it in Athens because it was shot on location and the locations are great. So it has a slightly different feel to the usual Cronenberg things. There's only one or two shots of the sort of sunny one of Greece and you see that right at the beginning and that's a real shock because we don't often see that sort of shooting from Cronenberg. 
if you look at his past work, there's um, a preponderance of browns and russet tones, oranges, realistic colours. And he's not a director who is sort of big on sort of the sort of visual exploitation of a colour palette in the same way that somebody like, say, Dario Argento, obviously an extreme example, would be. So the interesting thing for me was seeing that, but actually seeing some exteriors right at the beginning of the film. And the film begins with a shot of a little boy digging um, with a spoon um, in a rock pool or by the, by the shore. And his mother is admonishing him not to eat whatever he finds. Quite normal for a small boy to be admonished that way, you think. But then you find there's more to it. In this near future world, pain and most diseases seem to have been eradicated. And that reminded me of a DG Compton's novel, The Continuous Catherine Morton Hope which is a reality TV sort of novel, which was written about 1972. Its main precursor as a sort of vision of reality TV would be Nigel Neal's play, The Year of the Sex Olympics, which is a television play from the 60s. You could reference Norman Spinrad's Jack, Bug Jack Barron here as well, because that's about interactive TV, but that's a different sort of thing, really. But it did remind me of that, and Continuous Catherine Morton Ho is about a woman who goes on a reality TV show um, because she's dying of cancer, that's very uncommon. And it sort of goes from there. And it's a fantastic novel. You can get it both in the UK and the US. So in this future world where there is very little pain and not much disease, a sort of new sort of underground has grown up, a sort of performance art situation where people are finding new ways of expressing their sexuality. In a very, generally in a sort of sadomasochistic way where they're using their bodies and doing all sorts of strange things with them, mutilating them, what have you, with partners. And into this milieu comes a performance artist called Saul Tenser, played by Viggo Mortensen, who throughout the film mostly wears a black robe with a hood and is covered up a lot. And something that's happened to him because of this um, this change in, in the human body is it, is that he's growing a lot of tumours and, and sort of organs which didn't exist before. And he, it, this causes him great pain. He's a sick man, but he's met a surgeon played by Leah Sado. The character's name is Caprice. Obviously, that has a significant literary meaning. She's capricious. They obviously have some sort of erotic relationship around this. Performance art that they undertake involves her operating upon um, Tensor, removing these new mutant organs which are appearing, which reminded me rather of the sort of things in The Brood, where of course under psychoplasmics, people's bodies start to revolt. And of course the ultimate expression of that in The Brood, even though it affects several characters, is of course the Brood themselves, as they escape from Frank Carver's wife, played by Samantha Egg and the, um, the horrible little beings. So that's a precursor and there's loads of sort of references to Cronenberg's other work in this and one of the things that you notice in it is that there's a part where there's dialogue about how artists you know have an obsession and they basically riff on that obsession and they repeat it and look at it from other angles and I think most great artists do this actually. That tends to be the thing they have one thing and they look at it from all sorts of angles. I mean Philip Gay Dick did that. I think Christopher Priest does it. You can apply it to all sorts of artists and all sorts of medium and Cronenberg here is obviously commenting on himself and on the obsessions and what have you so in that way it's rather Balladian and Berezian as well. This performance art also reminded me there are lots of literary precedents and you know Cronenberg the reason why I like him so much is that I see him as a writer first and a filmmaker second. The reason why his science fiction films are so good is because they are so literate and literary that they are as much about what is said as about what is shown and of course he's notorious for showing the unshowable but his characters also speak the unspeakable which is a really important thing in his work. So I was reminded of a short story by Christopher Priest, um, an early short story, not one which I really like very much, called The Head and the Hand, which is about a performance artist who gradually removes different parts of his body in a live setting. And, and it's not really one of my favourite Priest stories, I have to say. It's one of the more famous early ones, but to me it's not typical of his work. And for him it's quite sensationalistic, And uh, but it, it is a kind of affinity with that there. Now, of course, Priest wrote the tie-in novel for Existence, which famously Cronenberg wasn't very happy with. And I think um, for Chris, that was a sort of difficult experience. And I don't really think that Cronenberg appreciated um, Chris's work and, and really sort of didn't seem familiar with it. And I, I think that's a shame because I think to me they were a marriage made in heaven, but it didn't quite sort of work out really. 
that's the relationship between the two main characters, the patient and the doctor who are performance artists. And there are lots of the usual sort of special effects you get. Uh, Mortensen sleeps in this bed, which is sort of like a biomechanical device and he's jacked into it and it obviously sort of turns him in the night. It tries to sort of deal with his sickness, which is ongoing because he can't be cured. He just keeps developing these organs. And there is a sort of background sort of counterplot to this, which is about a underground group who really their focus stems out of the opening scene of the little boy by the sea. And I'm not going to tell you too much about that, but it does turn into a fairly typical Cronenberg SF plot. And it's the kind of SF plot that you see in things like Scanners and Videodrome. The thing with Cronenberg, he is arch. Visually, he's stunning. Very, very interesting, strange special effects, what have you. But often the plots are more simplistic than people realise. They're often just a conflict between two groups. And you get that in Scanners and the conflict between Scanners led by Daryl Revick, who want to sort of dominate the Earth. And that goes right the way back to Henry Kettner's Mutant, the Baldy stories, as they were called. So, you know, it does go re right back to the golden age of SF. And throughout to Philip K. Dick in Ubik, you have the conflict between the two different groups of size, Renseter's lot and the other the other sort of cadre, as it were. And you see this in Scanners and you see it in um, Crimes of the Future, except in Crimes of the Future, one of the antagonist groups is a police group called New Vice. And New Vice are there looking out for unauthorized and dangerous changes in human evolution. I want to say a few words about Kristen Stewart as Timlin, who I think did a fantastic job. And Timlin works for this agency, which is about the registration of new organs. And, you know, they're watching that in case mutations happen, which are dangerous to the rest of humanity. So it is also a John Wyndham type thing, rather like the chrysalids, where there's a new group emerging. Again, that goes back to Henry Cutler's mutant. What, what is the moral thing to do in that situation? Do we allow new humans to evolve? That's obviously X-Men as well, which again sort of derives directly from mutant. So aside from these things, there's also sort of references to Cronenberg's earlier films, like the Videodrome I can see in there, the Brood, particularly Scanners, Existence with the bioports and what have you. And all these things have their sort of precedence in SF, you know, Delaney, people jacked into machines, all the stuff that Delaney does about the body and about S&M is in there. And, you know, even flashes of William Gibson. And of course, um, Cronenberg would be familiar with all these people. You know, he was an SF reader as a kid. Um, his first attempts to sort of become a professional artist were submissions of stories while still a teenager to SF magazines. Then he discovered filmmaking and it went from there. And he became the world's um, best science fiction filmmaker, in my opinion. You know, he's not somebody who makes films about people running out of corridors and spaceships. And he's all the better for it. She is absolutely fantastic. And the, the pivotal scene in the film to me is she is clearly fascinated by this new sexuality, which is rising out of people not feeling pain and be able to modify their bodies and what have you. And she is clearly obsessed with um, with Tensor. And at one point after one of the performances, she whispers in his in his ear, surgery is the new sex, I think it is. Um, and he sort of half ascends to that. And there's a wonderful scene where, well, I'm not going to go into it, but she really plays it fantastically well. And he utters the key sentence in the film for me, the most important sentence, which is um, about um, the change in evolution and how it relates to sexuality. And that, that's something which Cronenberg has looked at before. There are other things which, you know, remind me there's one scene with two very strange female characters who are incredibly creepy and they are brandishing implements which reminded me of the instruments to be used on mutant women in Dead Ringers. Um, so, you know, there's all sorts of stuff in it. There's stuff from The Fly in it. It's probably the best science fiction film I've seen for many years. Um, where is it in Cronenberg's oeuvre? Well, I've only watched it once. I do need to watch it again and let it seep into me. I haven't watched it in full 5.1 surround yet. So I'm looking forward to that. The music by Howard Shaw is as good as always. And um, Carol Spear is there on production. Deidre Bono on casting. So it's some of the regular people he's worked with on not many years. So it's great to have you back, David. Whether we'll see another one, I don't know.
Looking back though, here's a copy of the Collector Screenplays Volume 1, published by Faber about 20 years ago, which contains the screenplays for his two early short films, which are Stereo, Crimes of the Future, the original Crimes of the Future of 1970, that is, and then his two major features, Shivers and Raybid. And Crimes of the Future of 1970, same title, different thing, great title, I find it title very exciting indeed. And you can get to see these now. I mean, I first acquired them in a, I think it was the Blue Underground edition of Fast Company on DVD, which had an extra bonus DVD, which had those films with them. I, I had that for at least 10, 12 years. Um, I moved it on because since then, um, Arrow issued the early films of David Cronenberg in this set which you can get individually my copy which i'm showing here is from the more recently released uh, videodrome deluxe edition from arrow and videodrome is my favorite film of all time and i've watched stereo and crimes of the future many times and they are two of my favorite sf films i've had several editions i used to have the arrow standalone one i've moved that on so i'm on my sort of third incarnation of those and of course on blu-ray they're in higher def even though they're sort of low def materials really so crimes of the future the original one we want to talk about that it's an hour long it was filmed silently on a i think a university campuses in canada and the basic plot again is near future and there's been a plague or a virus outbreak caused by a guy called antoine rouge who described this disease which either he created i can't recall the details or he identified as coming from a type of cosmetics and it spread amongst all women using these cosmetics and it killed the female part of the human race so there's a huge crisis so there's only men left on earth so it's rather like the comic series from about 15 years ago why the last man where there's only one man left in this there are, there are effectively no women and the world has lost femininity so it's a real issue the film is fronted by a character called um, adrian tripod and was played by a guy called Ron Lazodic, who was, I think, in um, university with Cronenberg. He was an actor, he was gay, and Cronenberg said he had a very sort of medieval sensibility. And he appears in Shivers, and he's also in Stereo, Cronenberg's first film, I think. Um, but I'm not certain about that, so I need to check. Tripod is sort of making his way through this strange new world. And he, what you're seeing is you're seeing men trying to sort of cope with the, with the lack of women and there's things like foot fetishism in it and he has a collection of ladies underwear and he's going to hook up with this little sort of group of paedophiles which just make you sort of flinch a bit who've managed to acquire this little girl and they're going to artificially induce puberty in her by some scientific means which will allow them to impregnate her and resurrect the human race they're going to breed and hopefully get some female children and go from there so it sort of seems quite unpleasant all this is told you in a voiceover because the film was made silently and collect the screenplays for volume one there's never been a volume two interestingly which is super rare now it's a paperback original basically the voiceover is a new wave science fiction story and the voiceover of Stereo, his previous film, is the same thing again, because it was the same thing. He just shot these images and, and then wrote the voiceover short stories, and they were read over the film by the, the lead characters. They are new wave science fiction stories of the kind that would have popped up in New Worlds in the late 1960s, which is one reason why I like them so much. And um, I would say do try and get to see the original Crimes of the Future and Stereo and the earlier one, because they are on the same disc in the Arrow set. You can get the two together. And Stereo is a film about telepathy and it's a precursor of scanners in lots of ways. And it's really fascinating. And, you know, if you like genuine SF, if you like it strange rather than the obvious stuff, as I say, running around corridors and all the cliches and what have you, science fiction films have looked the same. I mean, you go back to Alien 1979, I mean, it's decades ago and most films still look the same now. So that kind of shows you where SF is, it hasn't redeveloped. Really so this is genuinely strange stuff and I would recommend it. So that's Crimes of the Future. At some point, there'll be a Blu-ray in the UK. Hopefully, there'll be a cinematic release because I would like to see it on the big screen. It is my SF film of the year. Soon, I'm going to do a top 10 or top 20 of the best science fiction films that I've seen this century, that have been released this century. And it will avoid the obvious things. There will be things you probably won't have seen, which are worth looking out for. It really, it's about showing that even though cinema is way, way behind the written word in SF, there are some people out there doing some interesting things. So this is Outlaw Bookseller signing out for now. And thanks for um, listening and thanks for watching. Please subscribe, like, comment and all that. 
and I'll see you again soon. Bye for now.